Okay, so um, now we're going to go into a series of three talks um, from the three chairs, I guess, of the PMCs. First, Sean is going to lead off. Sean Murphy, talk about I2B2. So, uh, hello, everybody. Um, good to see you all here. Um, we actually have a nice day today, so anybody that wants to take a nice walk at night, uh, it should be very beautiful. Not sure about tomorrow or the rest of the week for that matter, but uh, I think that um, we've gotten one day and that's uh, that's pretty good in Boston. Anyway. Um, so uh, I think that what we can kind of look at today is some of the ways that I2B2 is uh, working with Transmart and I2B2 Transmart, all of which have come together in this community. And frankly, we would be very happy if we could get more groups. So for example, you know, LEAF, right? Could it come in? That would be fantastic, right? In some ways, I2B2, way back in 2007, when we first released it, was to be a catalyst, not to take away from the name of Harvard Catalyst, by the way, which is to be a catalyst, right? <laughs> a catalyst for these kinds of applications, which we've seen, right, come up. And so the idea that we could put more and more medically oriented research applications into a group like I2B2 Transmart Foundation is always, has always been the goal, right, of doing all this work. And so whether the actual things, you know, persist or not, I think is something that the community, the community should decide. And so what we've been working on in, um, in the past year or so is really trying to get the community wiki and the community websites up to speed so that we can do as much sharing as possible. And I think the folks on this slide here have worked extremely hard on doing that. Most of them seem to be sitting in that area over there. I don't know if people want to stand up or, uh, but anyway, all right. Modest people, but nonetheless, um, uh, extremely hard to, to get this all to work and expose, right, some of the great work that the community has done. So it's all on, or not all of it, well, so some of it's on <laughs> community.itb2.org. And that was the real goal, I have to say, for this, for this year. And um, we've uh, been putting together some new documentation. Again, it's really to try to just make it um, into, you know, others that are trying to do similar things. You know, what is it, the principles that we're working on? Why are some of these things important? Um, a basic premise, right, that we have that I do not see in other research medical communities is that we want to make things available, not just to like fellow, you know, uh, detailed researchers like we all are here, right? And, the little, and software developers and stuff, and that's us. Okay, okay, fine, I get it. But to clinicians and researchers in a broad sense, right? So that we can provide them, we can provide them with insights into our world. That's the key. And that's what you've been seeing all day. That's the goal. And that's what you have achieved. And I look at everything, I mean, just going around this room, I can see every group doing it in the slightly different part of the elephant that ends up creating the community, which now has a fantastic resource available. And that's what we're doing. So all this stuff, right, that we kind of we try to maintain. So what what we what the I2B2 little group tries to do is they try to keep the websites together, try to keep what I'm going to call the kind of like the, the prototype tool, right? 
it's a it's a good tool to kind of start with, right? I mean, it kind of shows off like the ideas behind, you know, how you can do things. These days, I have to say, I mean, I've seen six web clients that are lot slicker and that can do great things. And I just want them to join, right? And they have, I have to say. I mean, so Glowing Bear, right? Great tool. I think that's something that, um, you know, we really uh, think could join. And that's what um, uh, Sean Louise been using. I don't know if it wasn't there in that part that you might have called that out. But anyway, that's great, right? And I think it's just it's such a great example of how these things kind of continue and 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 um, and make themselves better and better. So in the prototype that we have, we kind of put together a few more things in 7.10, um, things that would fail a cloud security audit, right? We put it. So we made sure that it complied with all the cloud security audits. That has to do with the way that passwords are managed and so forth. Um, we did a few things just to expose how you could do custom breakdowns. So a lot of things were being done, but they were being limited to those breakdowns. We show we just kind of put in the prototype, okay, so you could really do any breakdown, right? Because the principle is to use the patient set and then some stored procedures to do a breakdown. At the same time, preserving patient privacy, right? So that you can obfuscate some of the results if they're an obfuscated user. Because this idea that we have different privacy levels is really important in healthcare research. And then finally, um, we, we, we implemented fully um, Ben Schneiderman's <laughs> temporal query interface that he designed uh, in 2000. Eight, I think, or what was it? Uh, where's David? Is David here? There you are. When was that? That was like 2008 or 2009 that, that he actually did that? Maybe even before that, yeah. So anyway, so it takes a while sometimes to get to these things, but it, but that was such a good uh, uh, thing that he had done that we, we felt compelled to put that in. Um, and then in 11, we, uh, we finally got permission from Partners Healthcare, not the easiest thing to do, to make everything under the Mozilla license, since they were very concerned about liability and what it could mean and so forth. And then we had to add, and we took, the, this is an open MRS uh, healthcare uh, disclaimer, right? So if you go to their website, you'll see the same thing. Um, Basically, it says that you're not liable, right, for bad things that happen, right? It's at the risk of the people who are using the code, which is very, very important for all of us. And then um, we implemented a few, uh, things, some, of, um, some of the infrastructure that we had with JBoss was getting uh, a lot of security issues were coming up and we had to keep patching it and so forth. So we, we, we adopted Wildfly. Um, we made it easier to put in SSL between cells because a fundamental part of the architecture of I2B2 and Transmart for that matter is these web services. And so the web services uh, are hardened with SSL. Again, it was kind of for a cloud security situation that we needed to adapt to, or we needed to implement or make sure we complied with. Um, and then we tried to continue in, uh, the, this um, idea that the reason that you can make a plugin for I2B2 that operates with all the other I2B2 stuff, the previous queries, the ontology items, the panels themselves, right, is that they're objects. And so making the objects draggable expresses, right, that that's what's going on, because that's why every, that's where all the interoperability comes in. And that's why you can make a plugin in I2B2 and everything can kind of interact with it. You can drag in the patient set, you can drag in the ontology items, right, and run the queries and run the, the whatever you're doing with exposing the patient sets. And then, um, we made this the paging a little bit more robust 
And we're working on that very hard these days, by the way, to make it. And I think that Paul Avalox group has done an excellent job, which he'll show, um, of, of, of doing this. Um, and, um, and then we started to adapt, or we, we in, in 11, we adapted so that it was fully compliant. If you wanted to put identified information, you could distinguish the identified user to only have access to even viewing certain ontology items. And that way for ACT, we could build in, so for the accrual for clinical trials network, we could build in that folks could actually put identified data right in I2B2 and the full circle would be compliant such that only if you had identified permission, right? If you were in an identified user, uh, uh, could you even see the ontology would let you get, which lets you get to the names and addresses and so forth. But if you could, you can, um, you can use those to recruit patients for clinical trials. And um, that's what Vivian is gonna show wherever she went. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> in one second. As soon as I finish uh, some of these illustrations that uh, Jeff was, by the way, so nice to put together for me about how you can drag objects like um, patients, right? So you can actually drag patients around because they're an object. You can uh, uh, put things in different folders. It just makes it um, very easy to work with single patients, right? Which are obviously very important in something like a clinical trial or when you have identified data and you want to look at the data on just one patient, for example. And then we did a little bit more, again, thinking about ACT in terms of there's going to be thousands, if not tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of queries. And so making it easier to search through those queries was going to be very important. Um, and Jeff will show you more coming in 12. And now Vivian, who's the manager for all of our ACT plugins that we can create. So remember, the point of this prototype, we'll call it, of the I2B2 interface is to allow plugins so it can adapt to different situations. And Vivian and her team has been the ones to make it so it can adapt to a, the full cycle of accruing patients for clinical trials. Hello. So with a show of hands, how many people here are using ACT? Quite a few. And how many others have heard of ACT? Okay, a lot. But there are some that haven't, and ACT stands for Accrual to Clinical Trials. It's a CTSA. And it is was formed to address the issue of recruiting patients to clinical trials because a lot of clinical trials fail because they can't recruit enough patients. And in cancer trials, the statistic is 20% fail because they can't enroll enough patients. And that's really tragic because it's waste money, it's waste time. And then also the treatments are not gonna be made available to patients ever, or they, it will take a lot longer. So that's what one of the things, or that is what ACT is trying to address, one aspect of that. And so what it's based on is having a federated network using Shrine of I2B2 sites. And right now, we have 32 CTSAs connected. Is that true, Elena? More. 42. 42 and growing. And so uh, these sites have come on in waves and we're currently in wave five of spinning them up and connecting them to the network. And it's phenomenal because a site can run a query and have it broadcast out through the shrine to all the other sites and instantaneously get answers. The answers are aggregate totals. So you can see what's available at all the sites. And there are many, many data elements and that can be queried. It says 440,000, is that, do you know if that's correct? It's a lot. So now we are able to connect all of our sites or we will be, we're working on it and we can run an aggregate query and we can get these totals and that's wonderful. But what do we do with them? So what we want to do is 
define the query locally. So I want to make clear that we're not actually sharing all the data. We're sharing these aggregate totals, and then it's the job of the local site to go ahead and find the patients at their site and conduct the trial. So we need to be able to find the exact query. And one of the reasons that's important is because we think that the process of creating a query, which a query represents the eligibility criteria for a trial, and we think that process is iterative. So you may run several queries and play around with different data elements until you hit on the right one. And once you do, you want the other local sites that are going to be engaged in the clinical trial to be able to find that query and rerun it. So once they are able to find it and rerun it, we also want them to be able to get identifiers out so that they can then try to enroll the patients. And then also we think it might be useful to sites to be able to screen patients, uh, pre-screen the patients on screen so that at the local site, if they have other data elements that they think are useful that they need to add, they can do that. So I think people have seen some of this, but uh, this is the first, answering the first question of finding the exact network query. And in, this uses the idea of flagging a query. So the query would be flagged and you would know which one to look for. In this case, you were looking for the antihistamines test partners query. And this, this tool allows you to sort by different fields and uh, to look through who created it and different, all different aspects of the query. And then you can look at the query. This is kind of a, not really a great example because it returns 281,000 subjects. And we probably would have a query that would have more query items and would be more whittled down. And now we have another plugin that allows you to drag that query over or drag a patient set over and then export those I2B2 patient numbers into a file. Now this is the third thing where we have another plugin that allows you to look at the patients and what it allows you to do is drag over query items of interest into this review table of patients screen. And then you hit run and you can see this information for the patient. So you design what you want the table to look like, and you can look through it patient by patient, and you see there's a check mark for patient 18937. That means you want to include that patient in your study. And in the future, based on the uh, reuser roles that Sean was talking about that were introduced in 1.7.11, we want to make this like a full service model where eventually you might be able to go from I2B2 and just get the identified data for the patients and then enroll, call them to enroll them. Thank you. Very nice. So now I'm gonna call Jeff Klan up to the stand. And he's going to talk about uh, 112, but he's also going to talk about where we're going in terms of building more community stuff and thinking more about that. Jeff. Hi, so I'm Jeff Klan. I, um, I'm new to the ITV2 core team. The newest iteration of the ITV2 core team is Mike Mendez and I, and in this small, lean version of the core team, we're, we're really focusing in on making I2B2 more accessible to people and engaging the community, trying to make the, the efforts of the community more visible and more available to, uh, to users to install and download. We are also, of course, maintaining the core I2B2 platform. And so I've got some cool stuff coming up in 1.7.12 that we're planning on rolling out early this fall. Um, we've to, uh, Mike and I have talked a lot about uh, making I2B2 easier to install, uh, getting more data in, getting more data out, and so those are the kinds of things we're thinking about. Um, so the 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 big the big feature that Mike has been working on is making a kind of a, like a one-step install. It's not Kavi's one-step install that 
builds a Docker, con that, you know, deploys Docker containers. It, it actually builds it all from source. Uh, but there'll be one one ant script that can build build the entire platform, and then um, and then you, you still have to do the data install separately. But that's it's going to make things a lot easier. We're also encapsulating the properties files that were all over I2V2 in, in the various wildfly configuration directories. All are going into uh, the database now. Um, we are um, moving uh, this this feature, this total num feature that's been in I2V2 for a decade, I think. Uh, that shows the counts of patients in the ontology and does some query optimization based on that. We never provided a script publicly that actually computes all those patient counts, so we're rolling that into I2B2. Um, almost finished with that. Uh, we're rolling the ACT ontology into the basic distribution of I2B2, so that'll be an option in, if you don't want to use the demo ontology. So you can see an ontology that's currently used in practice. Um, and then we're, we're making some, uh, some changes to the web client. Uh, we're improving fine terms. I'm going to show that on the next slide. We're also uh, making this change on the web client. You can kind of see it here. Um, when, you, when you expand the left panel, right now you only see the current um, focus task. So you can expand the left panel, take up that whole section of the screen, but you can only see find terms or you only see workspace or you only see uh, previous queries. But now when you expand it, you see all the tabs. So it's just a bit easier to navigate. Uh, small change, but I think it'll increase the usability significantly. So um, we've gotten a lot of complaints about find terms. So when you when you try to find terms, you get all these errors that there's over 200 terms, and if you're doing a, any category, you get this five or six times, and sometimes the web client just overflows. Um, there's also a lot of duplicates that show up because you've, you're finding terms that show up at any level of the hierarchy, and so something like diabetes might be um, you might have diabetic retinopathy inside uh, diabetes, and if your uh, search is for DIAB, then you're going to get both. And you might not want both, you might just want the highest level folder, you might just want diabetes, and I'll take everything in that. So this is what it's going to look like, unless you have feedback and you'd like it to look differently, because it's still time to change it. Um, but right now on the left is when you search for gout in the default uh, demo ontology. You get back those results just kind of disorganized and, and kind of duplicating each other. Um, when you search now, you get it broken down by the category, and then you kind of can see the hierarchy. It says more specific results. Those are deeper in, in the hierarchy folders. And it also filters out everything that's already subsumed by another hierarchy folder. So you're only getting the highest level, the top level results that are relevant. So when I say only the top level results, I, I mean the only the top level results that you haven't seen before. So it's not leaving anything out, you're just not getting things multiple times. So this this makes fine terms much faster and much easier to navigate. And and uh, I'm going into too much technical detail, I realize I only have about two minutes left in Sean's 20 minute talk. So I'll, uh, I'll move on to the, the more conceptual stuff. We're thinking about this idea of bundles. A lot of people have developed these features. Some of the features are, are like a plugin, like uh, export XLS. So some of the features are more whole platform things like, uh, like Jean-Louis uh, Medco project. And we want to provide uh, bundles of I2B2 features that we can release as uh, packages. So we, we'd love to do this with, um, with, with anything that's out there that, that could be that's relevant to the, to the entire foundation's activities. Uh, so we, we're still looking at exactly how we want to do this. We want to uh, find a way to um, acquire the, the plugins, the code, get fixes. We would like to find a way to incorporate uh, the uh, unit tests into the Bamboo framework that we use to run unit tests against I2B2 and find ways to find a way to host it. Um, we're thinking of things like, well, like I just said, like an export plugins bundle or like a homomorphic encryption bundle, things like that. And we want this to be guided by community interest. So uh, find me, Mike, Sean, anyone on the I2B2 team to talk about this more if you have thoughts on how this should work. Because uh, I, think, I think having a, a pre-compiled or pre-configured bundle that people can download will make it easier for people to get I2B2 features than just having code and strewn about the community wiki, but um, we don't know quite how best to accomplish it. Um, we're also trying to find other ways of using this new community, this revamped community wiki, to engage the community even better. 
So we, we want to, um, we've heard that it'd be nice to see what more transparently what we're working on right now. So there was a slide I just show you on 1.7.12, but most people probably did not know that those were the features we were working on. So we want to make it more visible, like the things that we we're planning for the next release. So we're thinking maybe we'll just put a page I'm thinking maybe we'll add a page for release notes in the community wiki for the currently unreleased version that we're currently working on. But I'm open to other ideas. I'd love to hear from you. Um, we, we also want to know what the community is working on. We have community wiki, um, community projects pages on the wiki that we will continue to host. And I think that's a great way. But it might be more agile to have just some kind of uh, spreadsheet or online table or message board that shows what people are actually in the midst of right now, not things that they're ready to publish a whole wiki page about and have links to their uh, to their GitHub releases, but things that they're actually in the, in the process of working on or want to find someone to work with. Maybe they want to find someone who, who can help them do REDCap export. Maybe someone else has done REDCap export. It'd be nice to find a way for people to engage with each other. Um, so just looking at ways of doing that. Uh, also, uh, we're in the process of making some of the I2B2 Jira public just to kind of uh, be more transparent about the features and the bugs that we're processing right now. So if today, if you go to jira.i2b2.org, you can see a few things. You can see some issues that are currently in process um, that are or, or are being tested right now. So we're, we're trying to just be more, be more open in our open source initiative. Uh, and I move into other ideas too. Uh, it's... It's Sean's Q&A, but I'll, stick, I'll stand around in case anyone has a question for me. And then definitely come find one of us uh, today or tomorrow. Thanks. All right. Any questions? Yeah. Say there were six. Other developers made systems should be incorporated. Six other web clients. Yes. Leave. Uh, there's the I2B2 transmar. There's one that Ken Mandel and I think Paul is also doing, right? That one, the simple uh, uh, interface. Um, Clean query, yeah. query two, very good. Oh yeah, that's right. So the CTSA is developing a new Shrine web client that we hope to port to I2. Yeah, it's good. I'm glad you were. Glad you were here. <laughs> <laughs> Some uh, on those particular clients, will those yes. all be under OSI approved licenses? Will those all be under OSI approved licenses? It's a great question because you know uh, obviously it's the the folks that develop stuff are the ones who have control over the licenses, and so um, we. We ourselves, I mean, just kind of became compliant with an OSI license. So I, I don't know if it's too much to ask, but I think that, um, you know, certainly we encourage an OSI license because then people can build on it, right? Because if it, w without that, you know, it's kind of like a, it's a little bit of a dead end. And I know when everybody's building stuff that it seems like it's, you know, going to go on forever. But the fact is that it actually, you know, yeah, eventually you move on to other things and then it's hard to kind of keep it going while other people could take it and go and that's kind of what we're trying to do of course in this whole community so in that way it would be good to be an OSI process. Yeah. 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 Great. All right. Thank you.